bear with you. Uh, my interest in this started when I was 12 years old and I was working on a merit badge called Citizenship in the Community. So I go to the Roselle Public Library and I pull out a book called War Activities of the Borough of Roselle, 1915-1919. And that's how I found out that a lot of streets in town were named after guys who died in the First World War. And one of the ones that I was reading at that time, so I'm 12 years old, and I'm reading and I'm saying, okay, it goes, Private Theodore Roosevelt Minor, 369th Infantry, Company D, Rainbow Division. Okay? Private Minor was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, January 31st, 1901. Attended the public school in the city and also in Brooklyn, New York. While living in Brooklyn, he became a member of the Boys Brigade, thus showing his early patriotism. The Boys Brigade was a, a fundamentalist Protestant version of the Boy Scouts. Uh, it sort of lost its membership because the Boy Scouts were interdenominational. They took Jewish, Mormon, Catholics, Protestants, Buddhists, Hindus, whatever, while the Boys Brigade basically was more of a religious-based scouting organization. And thus showing his early patriotism. In 1916, he came to Roselle and was employed at the Van Court Inn. Miner had the honor of being the first colored man to enlist from the borough. He volunteered from New York and was sent to Camp Whitman, New York. Here he became a member of the 15th Infantry, Company A, the Rainbow Division, which was afterwards changed to 369th. This regiment was under the command of Colonel Haywood. He took part in several important engagements, namely Argonne, May 30th, 1918, Champagne Defense, July 15th, 1918, Champagne Offense, September 26th, 1918, and it was during the Champagne Offense that he met his death on September 26th, 1918, which means he enlisted when he was 16 and he was dead at age 17. He is presently buried, okay, Plot C, Row 3, Grave 35, the Moose Argonne American Cemetery, Montmartre, don't know my French, France. And it's Theodore R. Minor. So I was interested in this stuff, and I couldn't find anything <coughs> on Colonel Haywood, and I could not find anything on the 369th as part of the Rainbow Division. And that was one of the problems this was a unit that got screwed from the start, even before it got organized. And so much misinformation, that was, a lot of it was on purpose. Some of it was omission, some of it was on purpose, hiding facts. And misinformation. They were not members of the Rainbow Division. They should have been members of the Rainbow Division. But they were told there's no black in the rainbow. There's also no white in the rainbow, but you know, nobody thought of that at the time. Uh, Colonel Haywood is Colonel Hayward. That had me lost for years trying to find Colonel Haywood. So a lot of information was just difficult to find. But in the past couple of years, a lot more came out, and Hollywood, in theory, is going to make a movie. What happened was Max Brooks wrote this book, we call it an illustrated book, what you and I used to call comic books, called The Harlem Hellfighters. Okay? And Sony bought the, uh, the movie rights. They, in theory, want to make a movie about this. And that should be interesting if it comes out. But there were other people who did some research. And this book here is called Harlem's Hellfighters. Okay, the African American 369 by Stephen Harris. But the real excellent book is called Harlem's Rattlers. Because that's what they call themselves. They didn't call themselves Hellfighters. They prefer to be called rattlers, and their symbol was a rattlesnake with don't tread on me, all right? And this book has just tons of information. You've got to be a serious student. There's also another book that Dave has on his table that's designed for middle schools, okay? I think he's going to bring me the copy up here. But for years, I could not find information. And then History Channel in the mid-1990s came out with a video on the Harlem Hellfighters. This one's called The Harlem Hellfighters When Pride Met Courage by Walter Dean Myers. Okay? They've got it from the public library. You might have one in yours. <clears throat> what was happening was people were now doing some serious research, but there is so much contradictory stuff. And when I go through it, including the equipment they use and what they did, and I'm going to explain what I think is the logical stuff, but also what is probable and also what is possible. Now, 
In the 1900s, if you wanted to form a National Guard unit, you had to find people, convince the state that you wanted to create a unit. If they got what was called federal recognition, the state now had to build you an armory, and the federal government would pay for three armorers, three basically custodians who would maintain the building. And that was looked upon almost like a political patronage thing. You know, you create this unit, you got a job for three of your friends. And your unit will receive state recognition and federal recognition if it meets certain standards. Well, there was one black unit in Illinois, it was the National Guard, and they were the only one in the country. In most states, it was a white man organization. It was a social organization. Okay, you joined the, the guard so you and your buddies could sit in the armory, which always had a bar, and you know, hold meetings and, and drill and have a good time, and maybe the government might need you someday. All right? Well, in Harlem, there was a black middle class that was saying, we want our own unit. We want our own armory, right, in Harlem, where we can hold dances, where we can have meetings, and to show that we're part of this country. So they start applying for it, only to run into the politics of New York. The Republicans were the party that was representing the interests of black people. The Democrats weren't. But the Democrats wanted to get the black vote. So there was this back and forth, yeah, you can create a unit, but maybe not. And they're playing it back and forth. They're making promises. They tried to tell them, you can have a unit, but it can't be a combat unit. And if you want, we'll even let you have fancy uniforms. They're trying to buy them off. You know, if you just want to wear fancy clothes, blues and stuff, uh, maybe you can become an immune unit. Now, immune units come back from the Spanish-American War. The theory was that black people, being ancestors from Africa, were immune to yellow fever, malaria, and I forget what else. Dengue fever. Probably dengue fever, okay? So what they would do is they would assign them to work in the hospitals in Cuba and the Philippines here, treat the white soldiers who got sick, because you can't get sick. You're an immune. Ah, wrong answer. Okay? They got sick like anybody else, so that wasn't going to fly. So no, they don't want to be a hospital unit. They want to be a combat military unit. And that's sort of scary to John O'Ryan, who I'm going to get to later on, O'Ryan's roughneck. Uh, he's the commander of the National Guard. He had made a big impression on Leonard Wood and Teddy Roosevelt, and he jumped from like captain to major to lieutenant general real fast. He's in charge. And he's not looking forward to having any non-white units in New York. Okay? And in the wheeling and dealing between the Democrats and the Republicans, they sort of say, well, you can have a unit, but it's got to have all white officers. And at the same time, they're telling people, no, it's an opportunity for black men to become officers too. And it's this confusion that goes back and forth that's going to be one of the problems. They find a man named uh, Colonel Hayward. Now, he is head of the Public Service Commission. And they basically say, if you're going to have a unit, that white guy's got to be in charge. He's going to have to be the commander. And we can't have a position where there's black officers giving orders to white officers. That, that, that's not allowed. You gotta find a way around it in some way, maybe, but you really shouldn't be doing it. And you gotta enlist enough people and you gotta meet qualifications. Well, one of the qualifications is that you know how to handle firearms. But you can't get firearms until you're a recognized unit. Okay? Catch 22. Hayward finds a nice loophole thanks to America's oldest civil rights organization, the National Rifle Association. Very good. <clears throat> Colonel Hayward joins the NRA and creates rifle clubs. Because under the Directorate of Civilian Marksmanship, the DCM, right, under the Board for the Promotion of Rifle Practice, he can get 03 Springfields and ammunition for his civilians. Can't get them for the unit because you're not a recognized unit. You're not a recognized unit unless you can show you can use guns. All right. Now, what they did was under Leonard Wood and Theodore Roosevelt, they were the ones that pushed the promotion of rifle practice, 1903. 
They wanted Americans trained in the use of the service rifle. And here was the problem. Most Americans that had guns were hunters. And they preferred lever actions. That's number one. Or single shot. But most of all, they were slow firers. They were designed, line up that deer, fire one shot, go check the body, okay? They need to train people in rapid fire, bolt action, and use of the stripper clip. So they're gonna tell them, you're gonna have to learn to fire rapid fire, fire, reload, fire again, because your hunting skill is nice if you were snipers, but you got or sharpshooters, but you're gonna be combat soldiers. And was it that governor of New York? You don't need 15 rounds to kill a deer. <laughs> uh, my uncle Vito says you don't need more than two rounds to whack a rat. Whatever. <laughs> hunting and crime require different gun skills. Okay. <laughs> All right. These guys are gonna be combat soldiers. All right? And that's going to be the cause of their troubles with the system. They don't want black soldiers. Even though the Civil War, the Indian Wars, Spanish-American War, Mexican Punitive Expedition, the problem you have now is Wilson is president. Wilson, who was governor of New Jersey but came from Virginia, was the first southerner, true southerner, elected to the presidency after the Civil War. Okay? And the Democrats are the party of Jim Crow. The Republicans are the party of Lincoln. And Wilson is not too keen on this. He brings back segregation in Washington, D.C. He makes a big thing about honoring Birth of a Nation as a great movie for the family to see. Okay? So he is not going to be a big supporter. But in New York, there's the other problem. They don't want a black combat unit, okay? But it's recruiting, it's getting officers, it's getting training, thanks to the NRA, and it's meeting standards, all right? All right, the war comes along. Now you got another problem. The United States, when we enter the war, the Allies are saying, Good. We need one million of your soldiers here by Christmas. We just declared war in April. We want a million. U.S. Army, Marine Corps, National Guard. Yeah, we got a problem here. We don't have the guns. We don't have the people. All right. So what they're going to do is send over two hundred thousand by Christmas, not one million. They're going to send over what's called the First Army Division. They take all the regular army troops, create a division, because units weren't organized that way. That's the first division. Second division, grab all the leftover army guys, we don't have enough, two, corps, two brigades of marines, boom. That's division number two. Up north, the Yankee division. All you New England states, give us some bodies, boom, there's the Yankee division. We're now gonna create the 42nd Rainbow. And Everybody wants a piece of the action. So the rainbow is going to have all the other states. It's going to have the blue and the gray. To join the rainbow division, a state has to show it's got regiments that are up to full strength, full training. The only full strength, fully trained unit is the 369th. That, at that time called the 15th New York. Okay? Oh, there's no black in a rainbow. Okay. So now you got a problem. The unit Orion wants to send is the Fighting 69th. From the famous movie with James Cagney. Nobody made the Fighting 369. Maybe that'll come out next year after Hellfires. Okay, now, they, Orion goes around and says, I can get 3,000 re Irish recruits in no time at all, and we'll fill that unit up. It ain't happening. This is 1917. This is a year after the Easter Rising. Not that many Irish are content to join an army and be allies with the British. So he's got a problem. So what does he do? He scrounges the Irish from all the other units, builds up the 69th, which then becomes the 165th Infantry, 
and sends them over to the Rainbow Division. That's going to be New York's contribution. All right? Now comes the next problem. He's going to create the 27th New York Division. 369th, full strength, ready to go. Maybe we can be part of the 27th New York Division if we can't be part of the Rainbow Division. All right? They make an arrangement to send them to Spartanburg, South Carolina for training. The mayor of Spartanburg is like, uh, you bringing them up at E from north? Uh, we got a problem here. And they're going, well, if you got a problem with New York people, we won't come. Oh, no, we like Yankee dollars. We have restaurants. We have restaurants. We have hotels. We have forces of amusement. Um, tell our people to, to chill. But can you send us southern blacks? They know how we operate here. <coughs> These northern ones are going to cause us trouble. All right? 316, the 15th New York, they come down and they're told, be careful. If somebody abuses you, learn to ignore it. Step aside. Show discipline. They want to set you up. Because already in another part of the country, in Texas, there was a black unit. They got in trouble with the local civilians. Next thing you know, they're being court-martialed, executed, everything else. Say, no, don't take, take the heat. They go down there, they're going to be abused, they don't do anything to counter it. But Hayward is, saying, Hayward is going, my men are, are warriors, they need to, you know, we need them, we, we want to get overseas. Somebody goes, wait a minute, send them back north so they get brought back to New York. We can use you guys to guard things. Because you see, no German spy is going to pass for a black man in America. We're afraid of our own immigrants because some of them, we're not sure where their loyalties lie. And the argument is they know only one flag and only one country. They're not hyphenated. So we can trust them to guard the, the docks, the trains, the bridges. You know, you know, if anybody's ever had guard duty, it's a dull job. All right? So Hayward is still going, no, my troops need to go to combat. We need to get overseas. We're trained, we're ready. <coughs> And in the meantime, in France, the French are going, we want more bodies. I'm sorry, we need more soldiers. Okay? So they finally decide to send them. They put them aboard the Pocahontas. The Pocahontas was a German ship that was interned in 1914. They load them up. The Pocahontas sails at Hoboken, barely gets past Sandy Hook when one of its engines fails. Tow them back. Stay on the ship. Now, get off the ship. Get back on the ship. Stay on the ship. Okay, it's fixed. The Pocahontas goes off and hits a British oil tanker. All right? <clears throat> now you got a new problem. <clears throat> what are we going to do there? They go, we're not turning back. We'll fix it. It's above the waterline. And they go, okay, you can go. Oh, by the way, there's no convoy. There's no escort vessels for your convoy. So, see you across the Atlantic if the U-boats don't get you first. Okay? So off they sail, and they get near France, and they're like three miles away from France before an escort vessel shows up. Okay? They land at St. Nazaré. Now, St. Nazaré, which I want to really get into in part two, was the port of embarkation. Okay? They land there, and that's when we start running into other difficulties. The French are like, welcome American soldiers. Have you met our whores yet? All right, now, they're going... We'll do for you what we've done for the British and our allies. Red light means enlisted, blue light means officer. Uh, they're inspected by our doctors. Uh, welcome to our country. Now, our customs may be different from yours, okay? Well, <clears throat> if you were an American soldier there, if you went into town and you engaged in relations, you had up to three days to report to the medics and tell them, I think I did it. At that point, they gave you mercury, which they thought cured syphilis or gonorrhea, it doesn't. And two, they would irrigate your private part, which was a very painful process with a long meal. So, you first had to tell them, did the dirty, now treat me. If you didn't tell them a thing, and if you came down with something, you'd be court-martialed and lose a half month's pay. If you were a black soldier, they assumed you did something and you got irrigated and mercurized. <laughs> no choice, no volunteer, you know, sorry, we're just going to assume. And they're put on labor details, loading and unloading ships, uh, building roads, fixing railroads. 
and Hayward is, of course, very upset. You know, that plan is to use black soldiers as laborers, basically slaves in uniform. Okay, so Colonel Hayward <clears throat> keeps going up to Pershing and saying, "My men want to fight." That's when he finds out his unit has been redesignated from the 15th New York to the 369th. Now, the important thing is, if you have three in front of your number, it meant you were a draftee unit. <clears throat> He's going, we're not draftees. These are volunteers from New York. Well, you're the 369th now. We want to be in combat. We want to show you that we're good as anybody else. So Pershing is under a lot of pressure from the French. We want bodies. We want bodies. So he finally decides, I'll send them the 369th. All right? I'm going to get into the gear they get. But I'm taking away their Springfields. We're taking away their field gear. Let the French supply them. Okay? So, Haywood shows up at the French headquarters and he says, you know, I'm here. I feel like a baby abandoned on the steps. And the French general goes, welcome black babies. No problem. Okay? They already have black soldiers from Senegal, from other parts of Africa. They see no problem with it at all. And the French, luckily for Americans, are changing their tactics, okay? What was happening in France was the early part of the war, General Joffe was in command, J-O-F-F-E, -F -F -E, I'm probably mispronouncing his French name. And at that time in France, there were different uh, doctrines of how you fight a war. Doctrine is your theory of how you fight, okay? Now, they insisted that what you did is you fired artillery, then you fired volley, you didn't have to really aim, all you got to just fire a whole bunch of rifle shots. And then when you got within, they say, 600 yards of the enemy, you fixed bayonets, you got all psyched up, you had elan, spirit, and then you charged over 600 yards of terrain. And then after you captured the first trench line, you got out of it, you captured the second trench line, you get out of it, you get to the third, and when you run out of steam, you stop. Consequently, the Germans learn when they stop, it means they're out of energy. Now you counterattack, take back the fourth trench line, the third trench line, the second trench line, the first trench line, and you're back where you started, and body and the field's full of bodies. By 1917, Pétain, we don't need to get into what happens to him in World War II, he takes over and he he ignores Joffe's doctrine. Okay? Pétain developed a combination of tactics and equipment and employed them in spite of the contravention of the doctrine set out by the French military hierarchy. <clears throat> and the tactics were successful enough that it caused the French army to change its entire equipment procurement by war's end. The system Pétain developed started with short concentrated artillery barrage, often fired without registration, followed by a tactical advance featuring small units, the rifle section, armed with carbines, marksmen carry rifles. One of those marksmen carried rifles is here, okay? It is a label with scope, okay? And their job is to neutralize machine guns, any kind of high value targets, all right? So they're using these, and then he also tried to get a light automatic rifle, which we now call the show show, that could advance with the troops, and rifle grenades. When they got closer, they wouldn't charge those 600 yards. They would try to get within 200 yards, and then using fire and maneuver, they would advance, okay? Unlike the normal French and British system of the time, Pétain's system required the gains be consolidated as soon as they were made. Normal French and British standards had successful attacks followed by further attacks until all attacker strength was wasted and gains could not be kept. The Pétain system, soldiers who gained the trench dug in and prepared for defense and reinforcement, only taking on a new attack when the older one was protected. Now, when the Germans came into France, they realized they were going to be static. The military engineers said, pull back, take the high ground, pull, give up the land. The French attitude was, every inch that the Germans occupy is bad. Wherever they are, we're going to hug them. So, if they're here, we want to be here. If they're there, we want to be there. So what happened was, the Germans took the best terrain, and the French were hugging it. Except the Germans took the high ground, so when it rained, the basic law of gravity, water flows downhill, they were on the dry upper land, and the French and the British were in the mud. And the French had 
fields of observation. They could see sometimes into the British trenches was that bad. All right? Not a smart move. All right, so in come the Americans. And they're going to be trained. Now, they were trained on the 03 Springfield, one of the finest target rifle, battle rifles of the world. They're going to be at first given Remington rolling blocks. Okay? And we're very fortunate that Mark, one of our members, has a Remington rolling block and 8mm lapel. And that's where the story got started that American soldiers were equipped with American rifles. Only in early training. Now, dummy around, 30 out 6. It won't go in. It shouldn't go in. That's going to become important later on when I talk about Johnson, okay? So they get Remingtons made in Ilion, New York. They're from New York. That's nice. That's not going to be their combat rifle, though. The French are going to equip them with this. They're going to go from one of the finest target rifle, combat rifles, to probably one of the worst battle rifles ever created. And that's the Bertier, commonly called the Lebel. It's not. The Lebel is the other one with the, right there with the tube. I say it too, it's really hollowed out wood, but the Bertier was designed originally by the French for their Moroccan troops on camelback and horseback. It uses a three-shot clip. You put it in, work the bolt, when you've done firing, you put another clip in that forces the empty clip out of the bottom. Okay? Now, that was fine when you were on horseback. But if you're lying in the mud, all you're doing is letting mud and dirt get into your mechanism. And you have a three-shot rifle. That's all you have. You have a three-shot rifle. The French were in the process of converting to a, getting a semi-automatic develop, so they sort of stopped production of the, slowed production of the label, and they were making these really for their, their colonial troops. Because if your colonial troops got out of hand, you wanted your soldiers to have the 8-shot, which can be a 10-shot label if you know how to load it properly, versus a 3-shot rifle held by people who maybe want independence, like Algerians, Vietnamese, Senegalese. So they start making this rifle because it's, it's available. And they issue it as a second-line weapon for French troops, but it's a first-line weapon for Algerians, Moroccans, Senegalese, Vietnamese. This is going to be their rifle. And when the Americans arrive, welcome, little black babies. This is yours. Okay? And they hated it because after using a Springfield, this is like, what are you doing to me? And what the other thing that really bothered them was the French insisted that your rifle primary function is to be a handle for your bayonet. Okay? And they would train the American troops in fencing, they called it. That was the goal, was use the bayonet. The rifle was eh, it's a spear that shoots. Okay? So that's going to be a problem. Uh, grenade throwing. The, the French are going to tell them, and we were going to get to grenades here, lob the grenade. The Americans are like, what? They used to whip it out as a baseball. And they were, the French were getting 60 meters on a throw, and the Americans were getting 75. They were like, why would, you, why would you go like this? Okay. So in the training, they're getting their training, they're getting equipped, which we're going to get into, and they're going to be issued French helmets. All right. All their American gear was supposed to be taken away from them, except for their uniforms. And we're going to see probably something else wasn't taken away. And they get to wear French helmets, and they're also told that whenever they go forward to the trench line, they are to wear French uniforms. We don't want the Germans capturing you in an American uniform. We want them to think they captured or killed a Senegalese. Okay? The French also issue them wine, which the Americans didn't complain about. Okay? They're issued wine. 
which Art can get into with the, with the gear. The most famous event occurs in May when Henry, either Lincoln Johnson or Henry Johnson, he is from Albany. He was a porter. And him and a guy named Needham Roberts from Trenton, New Jersey, are put on a listening post. For those of you who were never in the military, this observation post is daytime, listening post is nighttime. OPLP. Yeah, OPLP, okay? So you're out there way in the front as a warning if anybody's coming. So Needham and Johnson are out there. And they start hearing noise. And the French guy tells them, well, you can, you can come back then. No, we were told never to give up an inch of land. We're staying. And they're hearing this, this movement out there. And they're hearing snipping of barbed wire. All right? Now, they do the smart thing, which is they, they start lobbing grenades. If you're in a listening post at night, you can't see the enemy, he can't see you. If you start firing, your muzzle flash is going to tell him where you are. Grenades are nice. Just throw them out there, and boom. If he screams, you know where he is. Okay? Now, next thing you know, the grenades are coming their way, too. So there's this back and forth, and a, and a gunfight develops, and a lot of questionable stuff happens there, but they didn't do it right the first time. All we know is there's a gunfight. And all of a sudden, Needham gets wounded, and Johnson's 0715 jams. We're going to get into the stories about why it jammed. But it jams. He is then attacked by a bunch of Germans, and he sees them, they're trying to grab Roberts. He pulls out a bolo, starts hacking away, left and right, drives them off, grabs Roberts, and starts bringing them back to American lines. Both of them are badly wounded. By pure chance, pure chance, there were two reporters who happened to just pop in on the, on the unit. And they find out, they sit down, they write the story. The story gets sent back to the United States and becomes a big hit. All right? Uh, the black press is, look at this, we've got our first black heroes. You know, they should have the Medal of Honor. This is great. This shows our people are, are participating in the war. You know, they're combat troops. And a lot of publicity goes out there. And Pershing loves it because at that time, all the publicity was either the Marine Corps or the aviators. <laughs> okay? And he needs them to have good publicity, even though back at home, Wilson, maybe the end of segregationists aren't happy about it, because the French are asking for more soldiers. The last thing he needs to say is, my black soldiers are a complete waste, they're useless. Oh, you want, a couple, you want two divisions of them? <clears throat> right? So they turn around and they praise them. And this becomes a controversy that wasn't ended until last year. The Medal of Honor is given to Johnson last year. Okay? Now, what starts to happen with, with, with the story? The story gets spread around. It gets magnified. He was attacked by 40 Germans. They were attacked by 20 Germans. Uh, one of the Germans called him a nigger in perfect New York accent. You know, probably had lived in the United States. All sorts of enrichment. Fake Johnson started popping up in, in the United States giving speeches for money, okay? <laughs> um, with Johnson, the bolo. That was a big thing, kept mentioning the bolo, and that's been sort of the, the question mark. So let me go into equipment. One of my articles that was written in 1918, okay? It goes, Mr. Johnson and his bolo knife. What the Philippines gave to the American Army and what one man did. Washington, June 29, 1918. A year ago, Henry Johnson, a colored citizen of Albany, New York, was peddling ice coal and wood in contended obscurity. Today, a soldier of the United States is wearing the coveted French war cross with palms because he proved himself a brave man and because at a critical moment he got his hands on a bolo knife. Everyone who thrills at a great contingent story of American heroism that trickles back from France remembers Henry's exploit. How on night duty with a companion in an American listening post, he took on 24, <coughs> we're going to see this number back up, jumping up and down like crazy, 24 marauding Germans in a swift rough and tumble, killed some of them with his knife, bombed others with a basket of grenades, and then, after he had been wounded, split so many skulls with his bolo knife that all the enemy left on their feet after meeting Henry became suddenly and violently homesick. 
The bolo knife that she welded weighed one pound eight ounces without scabbard and had a 14 inch blade. All right. Sharpened with a razor edge and near the end runs abruptly to a thrusting point. Most of the weight of the knife is distributed along the back of the blade. America first ran up against the bolo in the Philippines, where it originally an agricultural tool, just as the machetes in Cuba. Okay? When it came among the Moros, they had developed for war purposes, and the underbrush it proved a very terrible weapon, as many a trooper found to his cost. After our soldiers found there was no particular knack in the melee use of the bolo, they could not master it. They began to capture bolos and kept coming back to the United States as souvenirs. And then the United States started to experiment with them. Okay? Now, part that's true, this is a 1909 model bolo. Okay? This was originally going to be a general issue weapon. A weapon, sorry, tool. That's very important. It was considered an engineer tool. Well, after a while, they went to a cheaper version called the 1912, which I got here. All right? And it was a fine, well-made tool. When the war started, the War Department asked private commercial manufacturers, can you make these? Can you make them cheaper? They look it over and they go, you're kidding me. You're using high-grade steel. You have tolerances here that are fine for a pistol or a rifle. These are made by Springfield Armory. You guys are gun makers making knives. We're knife makers. We can do it at one-third the cost. Because you're going crazy. You got tolerances. You got this little catch. You're polishing the metal. And they come out with the 1917 Bolo, which there's thousands, millions of. And the government one costing $4.65. And this is going to cost $1.45. Okay? And they go, we can make a million of them. And there's two models, just so you know, if you run into these, some are marked CT, that does not mean Connecticut, it means commercial tank. What they did was, the original one was made in three pieces, and they would put this apart on the guard, then they would put the pommel on and braze it on. American Cullery and Plum look at it and go, no, nah, we can bake this one piece. And put this on, ah, you cut it here, you stick it on, you weld it, boom, out the door. And they start producing the cheap version. Now the question always was, what did Johnson use? Okay. We don't know. But here's the theories. It could have been one of these. Why? Because there were guys in the unit who had served in Cuba and in the Philippines. They might have brought them back as a souvenir and passed it on to them. It might have been in 1912 because they were a unit, they were a National Guard unit prior to the war. And the way these things were supposed to be issued was and you'll see up here, they were called the engineer tools. They were the shovel, the bolo, the pickmatic, the hand axe, and the wire cutters. And they're supposed to be spread out throughout the platoon. So you would, you know, maybe every fifth guy would have a bolo. All right? So they could have had that. Or they could have had the mass produced 1917 bolo. Along the way, Johnson mentioned something about I used a French bolo, and that's what throws everything off. There's no such thing as a French bowler. Okay? And they said, well, they, they had a machete from the Senegalese. The, the Senegalese were nowhere near. And there's a statement from Colonel Hayward saying he used, uh, you know, a, a bolo, which is a short, you know, knife with a heavy blade. So it was one of those three. Now, based on the racial attitudes of 1918, the article continues, incidentally, it may be noted that our color troops display a special aptitude and affection for this weapon. The white fighter is inclined to rely upon his automatic pistol in an emergency at close quarters, but the colored man in uniform takes us naturally to the bolo knife as he does well to the name of Mr. Johnson. Okay? As a matter of fact, there even was a song, Can I Take My Razor to This War? And it was sung in a black dialect, There will be no Dagon Kaiser if I can take my riser to this war. And the picture was a black guy with straight razor. Okay? So there were these images, okay? All right. And Johnson, in his attack on all these guys, the day after, a patrol was sent out to try to find stuff. And what they found is one of these German caps, except it was cleaved over the top and full of blood. They also found a big pile of blood that looked like somebody had gotten a belly wound 
So when they went through, they sort of figured out that at least four, at least four Germans were killed. And of course, they dragged the bodies back. They found three Lugers, they found wire cutters, they found a bag of grenades. So there was a fight out there. How many, we won't know, okay? Now, when it came to giving out awards, uh, these didn't want to give black men an award. They, well, there was an exception, Sergeant Butler. And Sergeant Butler got an award because he was on a, in a listening post with a show show like machine gun. And an American patrol went out. And as they were coming back, they were surprised by Germans. And the, the commander of the patrol was a lieutenant. And he sort of knew where Butler was. So he sort of like headed that way and was saying to him, get him, Butler. And, he, and him and the other soldiers dropped. Butler jumped out of his hole with a show show and in true Hollywood style, <laughs> wiped out the German patrol. White, ma white lives matter. The officer was white, did the paperwork, Butler gets a distinguished service for us. Okay? He, sir, he saved the white officer, saved three black guys. Johnson only saved the black guy, no paperwork, nothing. And one officer, white officer, got the Medal of Honor, a guy named Rob. And I think he was the only one from Idaho or something like or Indiana, and he gets the award. But after that, they just, they just ignored it. All right? Johnson is made a hero back in the United States. Okay? But he's not awarded even a Purple Heart. He's badly wounded. When the parade occurs in America, he's going to be carried in a, in a vehicle because he's so messed up. But he was an illiterate. And when he got out and they gave him his discharge, they never mentioned his wounds. As a matter of fact, there, the other guys who were wounded, many of them were put down as 29% disabled. Because at 30% disabled, you got a pension. So the doctor, 29, 29, 29. All right. Johnson sort of disappears from history. We know he got divorced and he dies in, 19, in the 1920s. And originally they thought he was buried in a potter's field somewhere in Albany. Uh, later on they found out that was a big mistake. <coughs> that was wrong. Okay? He is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. In 1926 he was buried there with full military honors. Okay? Now, there was a movement for many, many years to get him an award. All right? And the Clinton administration said he should at least get the Purple Heart. He was obviously wounded. So the Clinton administration awards him the Purple Heart. The Bush administration, all right, they're hit with the, you know, do something for the guy. So they decide to give him the Distinguished Service Cross. And it goes, the Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Henry Johnson, Sergeant U.S. Army for Extraordinary Heroism in Action in France during the period 13, 15, May, 1918. Private Johnson distinguished himself by extraordinary heroism while engaged in military operations involving conflict with an opposing foreign force. While on double sentry night duty, Private Johnson and a fellow soldier were attacked by a raiding party of Germans numbering almost 20, wounding both. When the Germans were within fighting distance, he opened fire, shooting one of them and seriously wounding two more. The Germans continued to advance as they were about to be captured. Private Johnson drew his bolo knife from his belt and attacked the Germans in hand-to-hand -hand encounter. Even though having sustained three grenade and shotgun wounds from the start, Private Johnson went to rescue of his fellow soldier who was being taken prisoner by the enemy. He kept on fighting until the Germans were chased away. Private Johnson's personal courage, total disregard for his own life, reflect credit upon himself, 369th in the United States of America. All right. Obama administration. They go back and say, you still need the Medal of Honor. And the Obama administration goes and tells the military, let's go look it over. And about a year ago, they come back and they find a couple other cases where they felt guys got gypped. One was a Jewish guy. They felt that because he was Jewish, somebody said, eh, no, put it away. Anyway, this is Medal of Honor for Johnson. Private Johnson distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a member of Company C, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Division, American Expeditionary Force during combat operations. Okay, against the enemy at the front. May 15, 1918. Private Johnson and the soldier were on sentry duty at a forward outpost when they received a surprise attack from a German raiding party of at least 12 soldiers. While under intense enemy fire and despite receiving significant wounds, Private Johnson mounted a brave retaliation, resulting in several enemy casualties. When his fellow soldier was badly wounded, Private Johnson prevented him from being taken prisoner by German troop forces. Private Johnson exposed himself to grave danger by advancing from his position to engage an enemy soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Wielding only a knife and gravely wounded himself, Johnson 
continued fighting and took his bolo knife and stabbed it through an enemy soldier's head. Displaying great courage, Private Johnson held back the enemy force until they retreated. Private Johnson's extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, United States Army. And that's his gravestone in, in Arlington, okay? And it has, you know, the Medal of Honor. All right, so what equipment did he use? We don't know. Now, Holly was going to make a movie. And if you're a production assistant, I suspect you're going to get this one. Nickel-plated. And they're gonna make sure that when he uses it at night, there's illumination rounds going off. Okay, moonlight, whatever. And of course, no time at all, these will be for sale for triple or quadruple the price they are now. And I'm sure somebody will make uh, Sergeant Johnson commemorative knives, and they'll be really nice, and they'll come in a wood case. And in no time at all, somebody will handle a domestic dispute with one of them. <laughs> yeah, the next thing you know, New York City, we gotta be in anything that holds more than four inch blade, you know. But, uh, <laughs> We'll see what happens. All right. The unit has served well. And I, I'm, I know I'm, some of the stuff I'm going to throw later on. But at the same time, uh, the French are being warned about American black soldiers, which is going to be very, very different when I get to Orion. The French are being told, you know, you got to protect your women, man. you got to protect your women, these, these black guys, you know, these, these American guys. And the French are like, but these are, these are decent people. We deal with them. And they're civil. The French are even telling their people, don't confuse American blacks with our, our blacks from Africa. These people have grown up in the city, in a civilized country. They're not our blacks, okay? And they're treating them with complete decency. And a guy named Colonel Leon, and this is where the, one of the misconceptions of history, I have seen so many places where they put General Pershing, warned the French, or came out of Pershing's headquarters, or Woodrow Wilson, there was a Colonel Lingon, Lenard, sorry, L-I-N-A-R-D. He was the French liaison officer at the American General Headquarters. And he issues what is called the Secret Information Concerning Black Troops. And in it, he basically tells French officers to exercise training of black troops or live in contact with them to have an idea that Americans don't like them. And, and if you treat them equal, that's going to create all kinds of problems. And, and if you show them respect, you know, don't do it, you know. That you, you, we don't want to get the Americans mad at us if we treat black people right, because we need their money, we need their men, you know, we need their muscle, we need their men, we need their steel. And it goes, the vices of the Negro are a constant menace to the American who has to repress them sternly. For instance, black American troops in France have by themselves given a rise to as many complaints of attempted rape as all the rest of the army. And yet the black American soldiers sent us have been the choicest with respect to physique and morals, for the number of disqualified at the time of mobilization was enormous. He's saying, you know, they think they're all bad, but the ones we got are pretty good. As a matter of fact, Colonel Haywood, thanks to that policy of irrigating everybody who went off post, had one of the lowest VD rates in France. And that was one of the things he said, look at my VD rate. All these other units have high VD rates. Okay? Now, Pershing tried to control prostitution. He was like, this is bad news. His first attempt was to ban it and to assign military police outside all the legal brothels. Okay. Here was the problem. The guys went to the illegal brothels and the VD rate among military police shot up. <laughs> okay. Among other things. <laughs> okay. Now, don't spoil the black soldiers is really what it comes out to. Now, here's the problem. It's a secret memo, right? We all know nothing stays secret for long, okay? And what happens is in the French assembly, there was a guy named Blaise Dijon. He was the black man from Senegal. He was a member of the assembly. He gets his hands on this, and he says, what is this nonsense? In America, W.E.B. Du Bois, who's head of the NAACP, he gets his hands on this. And he's going to publish it in the crisis of the NAACP paper. The postal system confiscates all the papers. People don't realize during World War I, the First Amendment went out the window under Wilson. The Espionage Act. You say anything bad about the government and we'll lock you up. So they confiscate this. But in the meantime, the French themselves, their general staff looks at this and go, what is the sheet? You know? 
And they go, ignore it. This is garbage. But in the meantime, it creates a ruckus. And after the war, when there's no more censorship, this is going to be printed in uh, black American newspapers saying, look at how they were treating us. Okay? And it's embarrassing. All right. The war armistice, okay. The war ends. Armistice Day. What are you going to do with the American troops? Most of them have been there less than a year. They're very concerned about black troops liking France. Some of the guys are developing romantic relationships. They're being treated as equal. They're being treated with respect. So what's the solution? Get them back home before they get accumulated to this stuff. So what they did was they loaded up one of the units and sent it to Savannah, Georgia. When they arrived in Savannah, Georgia, nobody tells the mayor. Okay? Nobody tells the mayor. And they come marching off the ship with their French rifles. And guess what? They get to keep them. Why? They're not government property. So they go home with them. And for a long time, they said the only black men in, in the Georgia region that had guns above 22 were veterans who had their French rifles. And who could buy, thanks to Reddington, eight millimeter bell ammo. All right? Now, the police commissioner in New York finds out about this. I got black guys coming back with guns. Okay? So he contacts the army and says, make sure you take their guns away. Frisk them, search them, whatever. They're, they're not coming home with guns, are they? All right? At that point, the 369th is being, is going to be taken out of France. And they turn in their French rifles and their French... Okay, near the end of the war, I forgot to go into this. They're not going to wear these. Hayward's going to say, I want American helmets. My guys are American soldiers. So at the end of the war, they're wearing Brodies, okay? So no more blue helmets, no more French rifles. They're totally re-equipped as U.S. infantry. 17 Enfields, field gear, all the neat stuff that we have here. And they look sharp. There's actual movies of the National Archives that have been released in the past couple of years. They're put aboard a ship called the Stockholm. This time they got a ship that works. As they sail off, the French go, uh, we're missing some stuff. Uh, can we have it back? And they go, what stuff? Horses. <laughs> we didn't take horses with us. Then where are they? Probably in the bellies of your people, but you know. <laughs> we have no idea where the horses went. And you got your guns back. All right? They arrive in Hoboken. And as they get off the ship and you watch the movie, Every one of them is a picture-perfect GI. Their gear, it's, 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 we used to call strap, everything is perfect. And they're carrying 17 Enfields. Okay? Now that the war is over, they're now equipped with American weapons. During the war, Hayward had actually asked the French, he said, we've captured enough German Mausers, and they are very similar to our Springfield. Can I equip one of my battalions with Mausers? And they said, no. They had to continue to fight with basically an inadequate weapon. As they come off the ship, they got 1917 Enfields with the bolts in them, looking sharp. And Hayward goes, you know, we were denied a parade. American troops, when they left for Europe, were given a parade. We were denied a parade. We want a parade now that we're home. And we're the first New York unit home. So they arranged to give them a victory parade, which I'm going to get into with the Orions later on. We're going to give them a parade. And if you look at the pictures of the parade, every one of their rifles has a dust cover. My question is, is there a bolt under that dust cover? They were allowed to march in a parade, but I think all their guns were deactivated. Now, there were people who wanted to mess them up. So as they march, there were people who stood on the side and started throwing coins. Figuring they'll drop formation, they'll scramble on the ground, they'll knock each over, they'll, you know, they'll grab the pennies or whatever. They ignore it. They stand straight. They march down Fifth Avenue from the Victory Arch at Washington Square up to Harlem. Now, even today, there's people who mess that up. 
This is from the New York Times from two years ago. Somebody thought he'd be writing a nice thing, you know. Let me find it here. The Victory Parade, I call it the Victory Parade Era. It's in the New York Times on the 15th. On February 17, 1919, the 369th Infantry Regiment returned to New York from France. Under a bright sun and cloudless sky, before a crowd of 250,000, the most decorated African-American combat unit to serve in World War I marched under the newly erected Victory Arch at 23rd Street and up 5th Avenue. White observers were awed by the spectacle of 3,000 black soldiers in French helmets, bayonets gleaming, parading in disciplined lockstep formation. Those were still in France. And bayonets stopped gleaming in 1917. But there's always somebody who thinks, you know, they're going to write it up the way it is. They march down. At the end of the parade, they're sent back to their base. Those that were from out of New York are sent to be demobilized. Those that are in New York, they're demobilized there. And that's going to create another problem. A lot of the guys had, didn't own anything but their uniform. So when they got out, they wore their uniforms. A lot of southern states made it a crime for a veteran to wear his uniform. Now get some raggedy clothes. Don't go around wearing your uniform to serve our country in. You know, get, get, you know, get, some, get some working clothes. But that was the, the kind of insulting that was going on with what happened to the 369th. And we're going to give you a break for those of you that have to, you know, leave, go home, whatever. And I'm going to get to their sister unit. We're going to see they're treated very differently. And that's where I get to the R-rated portion.